Hi, everyone. My name is Ben O'Dell, and I work with the Center for Faith and Opportunity Initiatives at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, or what we like to call the Partnership Center. This webinar is the third webinar in a series that will focus on mental health during uh, the challenges related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And in this webinar, we'll share how some groups are using this moment to train non-mental health professionals to have skills in addressing mental health challenges. I'll more fully introduce our speakers in a moment, but first, a few housekeeping notes before we begin. This is an educational webinar, which is off the record and not intended for press purposes. If you're a member of the press, we'll be happy to connect you with the press office here at HHS after the program. If you're having difficulty hearing us clearly, you may find it helpful to call into the number provided by the Zoom webinar platform rather than listening to your computer. If you're listening through a computer or any device, you want to make sure that the volume is up on that device. That may also help make sure you can hear the, the sound quality. If both of those are challenging for you, you may find it beneficial to participate through the recording that should have the audio available through it. Uh, you can also review the transcript that becomes available when the recording is sent out. To that end, we will be sending a link to the recording of today's webinar, along with a link to the slides used during the presentation today. So look for that in the follow-up email in the next day or two. And if you have any questions, you can email us at partnerships at hhs.gov. That's partnerships at hhs.gov. And finally, we do have a full program today, and we will get to as many questions as we can. That said, we're eager for you to share your questions with our presenters and with us. So let's give that a try now. Go to the Q&A tab and tell us what city and state you're joining from today. I'm looking to see, again, use the Q&A tab, not the chat feature. I see Michigan, West Virginia, North Carolina, Colorado, Maine, Tennessee, Atlanta, Arkansas, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Texas. We really do have so many of you represented from around the country, and so it's so great to have all of you here with us today. So let's get into the webinar. Here at the Partnership Center and in HHS in general, we continue to work day and night to address the challenges of COVID-19. Through the work of the Partnership Center, we equip faith and community leaders to address the needs and challenges of this pandemic. Even before this crisis, we did not have enough mental health professionals to address the need in most places. During these challenging times, we see people report increasing numbers of mental health challenges and concerns, and we believe this will just further increase the disparity of need to the number of people who are able to provide services. This disparity is familiar to researchers who work overseas and look at mental health issues. In that literature, Task shifting is the research-based, evidence-based practice that's been used to describe when people are trained with skills related to mental health that are more than just those skills held by mental health professionals. Grandmothers are being trained in CBT practices and faith leaders are being trained in how to identify mental health challenges. In some cases, they are trained how to meet certain levels of need um, in those communities. Today, our presenters will describe how they are doing work of task shifting domestically, training lay populations as well as clergy and how to address mental health challenges. To describe this, we will first hear from Dr. Matt Stanford. Matt is the CEO of the Hope and Healing Center and Institute in Houston, Texas, and he's also an adjunct professor of psychiatry at the Baylor College of Medicine and the Houston Methodist Hospital Institute for Academic Medicine. He's also the author of multiple books. He conducts training seminars and serves individuals with mental illness and their families. And so we're so glad to have him here with us today. After Matt, we will hear from Dr. Farah Abbasi. Dr. Abbasi is the Assistant Professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Michigan State University and a core faculty member of the Muslim Studies Program. She's from Pakistan and settled in the U.S., the United States in 2000 with her three daughters. In January of 2009, Dr. Bossi received the American Psychiatric Association FAMSA Minority Fellowship. She used the grant money to create awareness about cultural competency to redefine it not just as tolerance, but acceptance as well. 
Her areas of interest are cultural psychology and teaching medical students how to provide culturally appropriate care to Muslim patients. Lastly, we will hear from Evan Owens. Evan is the co-founder and executive director of Reboot Recovery, which helps veterans, first responders, and their loved ones heal from moral and spiritual wounds of trauma. Since 2012, Reboot has expanded to more than 250 locations nationwide. Evan has offered, authored several books, including the Reboot Trauma Healing Curriculum, and has been a keynote speaker at various conferences in, in trauma recovery space. So thank you so much to our presenters who are sharing today. And let me turn the presentation over to Matt to share a little bit about the work they're doing to address training for individuals uh, providing mental health skills. Matt, excited to hear from you. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, I'm Matt Stanford. I'm the CEO of the Hope and Healing Center and Institute in Houston, Texas. Uh, and I welcome you all to this um, webinar. I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the things we've been doing here in Houston over the last uh, three years in an attempt to try to meet some of the uh, uh, increasing demands of, of mental health care. Uh, as we all know, uh, in the United States today, a majority of individuals uh, with mental health problems never receive uh, any treatment, which is a very disturbing statistic, uh, given the fact that we often brag about our, our medical system, uh, but mental health care uh, certainly falls through the cracks. In fact, I often say that we have less of a mental health care system uh, and more a set of somewhat disjointed resources uh, in which it's very difficult for people to access care uh, or afford the care that they need. Uh, there's also, as we know, an enormous amount of stigma associated with this. And it's one of the very few, if not the only medical condition uh, in which individuals uh, really don't seek out care because they're afraid that they'll be stigmatized or shamed uh, by those that uh, find out. Uh, so stepping into that space uh, here in the uh, Houston area, uh, we wanted to make uh, mental health care uh, accessible uh, within any community. Uh, and accessible also includes obviously affordability, uh, not just uh, the accessibility of the actual locale. Uh, so what we've done is we've moved into faith communities because we do know that individuals in psychological distress are more likely to go to a clergy before they go to a mental health care provider or a physician. And that's particularly uh, true in minority populations, but it's true in all uh, ethnic groups uh, here in the United States. Uh, and, and as Ben mentioned, uh, uh, this is often found uh, in uh, foreign uh, countries when individuals are working in those areas that have less of a mental health care system. And really a lot of my uh, training and a lot of my experience comes from working in Libya during the revolution with traumatized populations of civilians. Uh, and really having no mental health care system to rely on and having to use peers. And so what we've done in the Houston area is we've piloted over the last three years, a network of trained faith communities uh, where we've embedded mental health services into those faith communities. Uh, so what we do is we uh, train the clergy and the staff how to recognize mental health care problems, how to make a proper referral. And we've vetted a, a network of providers, over a thousand providers for them to refer into. And we have found that uh, faith communities have trouble vetting providers and really knowing how to refer. So we do a lot of training around how to make a referral. Uh, we also teach them how to uh, relate, uh, how to uh, de-escalate situations, how to talk to families that are struggling with mental health care problems, and also how to set up restorative programs within their faith community. So one of the things that we're doing is we're setting up uh, support groups within those faith communities that are run by laymen or what we call peers. Uh, and we also are setting up uh, or training mental health coaches. And I think that's primarily what I'd like to talk about today. Uh, as Ben mentioned, within the mental health care system, we, we have a tremendous lack of providers. Uh, and unfortunately, in the mental health care system, when we talk about providers, we tend to think about individuals that are at the very high end of provision, those that have licensure and have gone to probably years of graduate school or medical school uh, to become a provider. The mental health care system lacks a, a, a number of levels of, of provision that you see in medical care. Uh, in medical care, we could name off a number of individuals that start at the what we would think of the lowest level of care. That might even just be people that are trained in first aid all the way up to the most sophisticated cover and minimizing symptoms. 
Uh, and so we could look at support groups, uh, the enormous amount of literature that exists on that. We could look at uh, things like certified peer specialists. Many of the states have criteria and certification for certified peer specialists. An individual who themselves has lived experience with mental health issues and is given a, a set of training, usually about a 40 hour training uh, that allows them to uh, become an encourager, a supporter, and an advocate for someone who has mental health care. But what I noticed as I uh, work with individuals who were certified peer specialists is they were actually being pushed uh, well beyond what the original scope of practice was. They were actually providing some level of therapeutic support to individuals, uh, providing some CBT uh, skills and tools, uh, doing some lower level counseling. And so there was a real opportunity, I thought, to begin to try to develop some lower level provider uh, that might be embedded within faith communities. And, and we call that a mental health coach. Um, and what we have done is we have, we have modeled the 40-hour uh, training for our mental health coaches around the certified peer specialist trainings that are available uh, today in about 40 states. Uh, they receive training in ethics. They receive training in uh, recognizing mental health care issues, how to make referrals, uh, how to provide some uh, different aspects of cognitive behavior therapy, motivational interviewing. Uh, you know, they know how to work with families. They provide, a, they, they really are given a lot of skills on not only getting people to professional care, but becoming an advocate uh, and a supporter for an individual who is going through that recovery process. Uh, so here in the Houston area, we have trained uh, at this point just over 100 churches uh, in the area. Uh, we also have about uh, a little bit over 50 mental health coaches embedded in several of those churches, as well as support groups uh, and then clergy and staff trained as well. And so what we are seeing uh, are thousands of individuals a year uh, being uh, engaged at the faith community uh, in the context of their mental health issues. They're being referred on to professional services and then uh, being provided with um, mental health services at some level, support groups, mental health uh, coaching, which is we use a CBT curriculum uh, for those individuals, which uh, all have been demonstrated to uh, reduce the symptoms uh, uh, in the individuals. And we're not working with individuals with counseling issues, we're working with individuals with serious mental illness. I think that has really been where I've seen an issue uh, in relationship to uh, what faith communities can offer. Faith communities tend to do a very good job with counseling issues, but really have not done much with serious mental illness. And I think there's a real opportunity there. Within the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, what we're seeing is, is what most people are seeing, a dramatic increase in anxiety issues, uh, depression, individuals with uh, pre-existing mental health uh, concerns like bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, uh, are, are showing a lot of decompensation, a lot of increase in symptoms uh, because their routines are, are being affected, their isolation uh, from society is being affected even more. And so we're seeing a lot of uh, increases in these things. And again, faith communities and mental health coaches are an incredible opportunity to provide a low level uh, kind of therapeutic intervention uh, that an individual can uh, receive very easily within their own community and for no cost. And I think these are the types of things that the mental health coach uh, really brings to the table that we're not seeing right now uh, in the mental health care system. Number one, it's really no cost. Once the training is provided for the individual, uh, they are embedded within a faith community, uh, and there is no cost for the services that they provide. Uh, secondly, it's easily accessible. Uh, individuals, as I said, are much more likely to go to a faith community. There are faith communities in virtually every neighborhood in this country. Uh, they just walk down the street, uh, and they're right there receiving some level of service. They don't have to go across town, uh, and they don't have to pay anything. And then I think What's also nice is it's a very kind of a destigmatized uh, in situation in which the individual is able to receive comfort and care, uh, some therapeutic support in an environment in which they feel safer uh, and they feel like they're not being uh, judged or shamed uh, because uh, they're not outing themselves in a sense because they have a mental health care problem. So mental health coaches, what we have found have, can provide a, a fairly high level of uh, therapeutic care for an individual. Uh, again, we focus primarily on cognitive behavior therapy and motivational interviewing. Uh, in no way is this advertised as professional care. It's advertised as a, as a peer delivered service. Uh, individuals are not charged for these services. Uh, and they, they can do this over a long period of time. It's not just short term. I will tell you that uh, in our cognitive behavior therapy curriculum that we've developed for 
the uh, pyramid for the mental health coaches. It uh, takes anywhere from six to eight months for a person to work through that with a mental health coach. And during that time, the mental health coach is able to get the family into psychoeducational uh, support groups that are offered at the church, make sure that the individual that with the mental health care problem is getting uh, proper uh, psychiatric care or uh, psychotherapeutic interventions. And it gives them a long period of time to act both as a kind of a advocate, case manager, a supporter or encourager, uh, and also as someone as a spiritual guide, because these are all faith-based interventions. Uh, and we find that individuals are very interested in, in incorporating their faith into uh, the therapeutic care that they're receiving. We have gotten a, a very good uh, feedback from the uh, mental health care providers uh, that uh, we're working with as well. Uh, they find this to be uh, of great value to them uh, because of what I think probably is probably the most important aspect of it is uh, as mental health care providers, we tend to see our clients kind of intermittently. Uh, we don't see them you know, every day. Uh, we see them uh, intermittently. If you're a psychiatrist, perhaps you may even see your clients uh, every few months, not necessarily even on a weekly basis. What a um, mental health coach allows an individual to do is to fill in those gaps of time uh, between the mental health uh, provider uh, interactions. Uh, using the curriculum uh, and, and having easier access to an individual in which you don't have to pay for every uh, interaction uh, gives you a chance to fill in those gaps. Uh, so if you see your psychologist every week or every other week, you may see your mental health coach multiple times during that period of time, or you may work on homework that your mental health coach has given you. It gives you an opportunity to have more of what we call touches uh, as you are on that uh, pathway of recovery. And we, again, have found great uh, results with this. We are finding, uh, uh, as we have expanded the network, that it's not just churches that are interested in, numbers of social service organizations that deal with anything from feeding the homeless to even uh, organizations that uh, just offer uh, assistance for utilities and things like that are being overwhelmed by individuals who have significant mental health care problems. And they have asked for mental health coaches to be embedded uh, in their organizations as well. So that somebody with the training necessary can be there at the front gate at the very beginning when a person walks in uh, so the individual doesn't have to stumble around uh, and try to find care on their own. In the United States today, it's sad to say that uh, the average uh, period of time that passes between an individual displaying symptoms and an individual getting their first treatment is 11 years. Uh, not 11 days, not 11 hours, not 11 weeks, 11 years. Uh, it's a disturbing, disturbing statistic. And mental health coaches and trained faith communities make a, a difference in that. Uh, here in Texas, um, uh, House Bill 18 was passed uh, in the last legislative session, which allows or, or actually calls for teachers to be trained in mental health care. And, and this is where we're moving into later this year is to begin to move this training into um, uh, school systems as well, uh, where there will be uh, teachers trained as mental health coach, as well as teachers trained uh, as clergy, clergy have been trained to recognize um, uh, and make referrals appropriate. Uh, I think it's unrealistic to look at pastors and teachers and try to uh, lay an enormous amount of, of uh, training on them in the sense that they have to provide some type of therapeutic care, but they certainly should be able to recognize uh, mental health care problems. And that's where the mental health coach again comes in. The mental health coach is a highly trained individual in that setting that that teacher, that that clergy, that whoever, whatever the organization is, can say, this is the person that you need to see, uh, and they will then become the advocate uh, and the opportunity to get that person to the professional care that they need, uh, and then provide them with the appropriate therapeutic uh, support uh, as they begin down that road of recovery. And that's the end of my time. Excellent, Matt. Thanks so much for that presentation. And it's so exciting to see and hear about how you guys are creating this new role um, that can help address more people the challenges and, and support them in the care that they need. So thanks so much for sharing that. We look forward to coming back to you with questions at the end of the presentation. Let's now turn to Dr. Abbasi. We're pleased to hear from uh, you and how you are working to train people in the Muslim tradition about uh, how to address mental health. Dr. Abbasi? So 
Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, I would like to begin with uh, wishing you all a very happy Eid. We just uh, celebrated Eid yesterday. Um, that said and done, um, Ben, uh, are you going to start my PowerPoint? Yes, let me bring that up right now. Sorry about that. So, uh, thank you, Matt. It's always really uh, good to connect back with you, and I always learn and get so many ideas, and I am always very inspired by all the great work you are doing. So, uh, coming from Muslim perspective and the work we are doing in the community, first of all, it's been amazing. We have a very dynamic movement going on around mental health where faith uh, um, leaders and mental health providers are coming together and are really great work being done from research to providing clinical services, coordinating better care, coming out with the directory, coming out with CME. So a lot of work is being done. That said and done, I thought I would like to uh, present this uh, with a case that I just recently um, tackled with. So that's why I call it a prayer, a Prozac or both. How do we start navigating the faith-based mental health? So um, I was uh, recently approached and we can go to the next slide uh, and the cases there. Um, that's, yeah. So I was, approached about this young male, a 27 year old. He belongs to a Muslim family, a practicing family. And this was month of Ramadan. So he's fasting. He's uh, not like, you know, with fasting, it's from sunrise to sunset. So your sleep can get affected. Your food intake, nutrition can get uh, affected. So I don't know if that was the trigger, but this is a 27 year old uh, male and he contacted the local uh, faith leader or the imam, as we call uh, faith leaders imam in Muslim community. And he said that he's going through the spiritual experiences that um, uh, he's uh, feel that the God is revealing to him different spiritual realms. He can see heaven and hell, then he's freaking out about the sins and about the trespassings and faith. But the imam, the local imam that I work with has also been in trainings for first aid mental health kind of training. Um, and he, while he is praying with him and is uh, reciting Quranic verses with them, realizes that there is uh, underlying psychotic breakdown might be happening as well. So he contacts me and uh, this is how we have created this um, model where we cross refer to each other. So he, he immediately picked on the uh, red flags and uh, referred it to him to me. And then I was able to connect him to mental health care. So um, I think this kind of is very central. And uh, that's where I wanted to start our, today's conversation. We can go to the next slide. So we know that if you belong to a religious community, like uh, uh, be it Islam or other faith-based communities, we understand that that religion and spirituality can be invaluable. It can be your uh, main uh, uh, source of resilience and healing. But those communities, we also see the stigma around mental illnesses can be deeper because people can feel that if my healing and my well-being is dependent on God, then me seeking care, is it that my faith is not strong enough? Is it a spiritual weakness? So the mental illnesses can get shrouded in this uh, religious um, uh, belief system that uh, should we just pray and not seek help? We can go to the other. And that's another thing I realized, and that's why I started working with faith leaders early on, that if you look at the hierarchy of help seeking, you can see that the first people, usually first responder becomes your faith leader, becomes your first responder, 
after you talk to somebody in the family or go to alternative healing prop, but then the faith leader become a very pivotal and very central in your uh, mental health care. And if you see, unfortunately, the mental health services are very down below. So we don't, we were not seeing patients till they were really sick or were in some kind of emergency situation where uh, either the police is involved or there is a threat to themselves or a threat to the family or to other people. So we were kind of at a point coming in at a point where it was very like crisis oriented, like a kind of a more reactive kind of treatment. And I wanted it to be preventive. We wanted to be pro, um, like start the uh, discussion with mental health rather than bring it later on. So I also want to give a little background. There are several classification of faith leaders uh, in Muslim community. So imams uh, is the general term you would hear a lot of time, and it re re referred to a position of leadership in context of worship and services. Um, and the traditional roles have been to lead prayer, prayers, deliver sermons, conduct religious ceremony, and provide religious and spiritual guidance. But given the new scenario, we are seeing Islamic centers play a very important role in the cultural religious identity of the Muslim community. And you would see these imams are, have to step up and do so, so many more um, uh, duties they are performing from political um, um, voice to be it an emergency situation like uh, COVID-19 pandemic, how are we navigating that, all that. So imams are uh, had to step up to do more. Um, we do have uh, chaplaincy, which is like a religious representative in a particular setting, such as healthcare, educational, prison, military, and other secular settings. So imam is more functional designated uh, a person to run a Islamic center or mosque, while chaplain can be certified and uh, be in more um, uh, like a formal settings like hospitals and prisons or military. Thank you. Go, we can go to the next. So like I said, they can depend on God for healing and may regard receiving psychiatric services as weakness of their faith. But another thing is they might interpret the, the symptoms as a curse, like am I being abandoned by God? Am I being punished? Uh, has God given up on me? So it's interesting that the mental illnesses can really turn into crisis of faith or the crisis of faith. If you are already questioning and doubting your belief system, then that can turn into severe depression and anxiety. So we see a lot of overlap. And that's why it is important that you see the every individual case from both lenses, from a faith leader perspective and from a mental health provider. We can go to the next slide. <clears throat> Another thing which is very interesting and have, we have to be really cognizant of from a mental health provider's uh, point of view, we really have to understand where the religious belief ends and religious delusion start. So we do see that in communities that belong or practice a religion or a faith, they tend to have, when they do have mental health breakdowns or have mental health crises, be it bipolar, schizophrenia, they tend to have more religious delusions. So like if you are manic, you might feel, oh, I'm God or God is talking to me. And schizophrenia, you can the, the voices can seem like, oh, the God is giving us commands or the visual hallucination can feel like, oh, I'm having a spiritual experience and it's not a mental health crisis. So as a provider, we have to, uh, until unless we respect and understand someone's faith practice, it would be hard for us to discern where is the religious belief versus where is it a religious delusion. And as we know, as we are going forward, more and more mental health providers, you know, there was a time that Freud and uh, even some present day psychologist, Alice would say, all the religions are just delusions. There, there, there's no religion. And the age old question, 
that did God create us or did we create God? So there will always be that school of thought. But what is very encouraging is that how American Psychiatric Association, American Psychology Association is now stepping up and understanding the importance of bringing your faith practices in your treatment plans. So in DSM-4, um, which was uh, our kind of, uh, DSM-4 is where, which, how we standardize the diagnosis in psychiatry. So it does exempt delusion is not a religious doctrine. They came out with that statement that it's not a pathology, but in DSM-5, they also created a new category, which is that if you are having a spiritual or religious problem, that has to be understood in the realm of how it can affect your depression and anxiety. So it could be somebody questioning faith or converting to a new religion or are just questioning your values. So that can be a very triggering factor for your mental health. We can go to the next slide. So keeping all this in mind, uh, I early on created a model uh, where we uh, started, especially locally. I belong to Michigan State University and I am located in East Lansing. So I started working with the local Islamic Center, uh, working with the Imam. So we did it two ways that Imam got trained in first aid mental health. Then also something like what Matt was saying, we created this leadership program in the community. So these are community health worker kind of, who have been trained in first aid mental health, also understand HIPAA and has been uh, kind of trained uh, in all this through the Muslim Mental Health Conference. We uh, not only brought trauma-informed congregation training, we brought substance abuse training, um, we brought um, so different kind of trainings, we keep updating that. And now we have a very successful model where we cross-refer. So if I feel my student or my patient is going through some kind of spiritual crisis, I would talk to the imam, refer them to the imam. And if imam feels that there is a concern around their safety or there is a substance abuse issue or let's say domestic violence is another area we are working very closely. And especially in COVID-19, we were really doing a lot of webinars together to make sure the community feels uh, supported and has the resources. We have developed a whole resource list uh, that uh, the community can access to. And uh, we have been uh, able to train uh, more than 100 uh, faith leaders in East, uh, East Michigan, so, but also now taking it uh, to different states in the country and now taking it globally as well. So of course the thing is the roles have to be really clearly identified, delineated, the boundaries have to be established and respected. So let's say if a mental health provider is involved, they would provide therapy or prescribe medications by psychiatrists and then the meditation, the uh, special prayers can continue with the Imam. That brings us to an, another important topic. Like I said, that this newfound role for the Imams or faith leader in the Muslim community has put a lot of pressure on the Imams. So they can be first responders from uh, political crisis, to mental health issues, to physical problems, to domestic violence, to uh, substance abuse, to this COVID-19 uh, emergency situation or uh, other kind of, you know, active shooters. There's so much pressure on the imams that I always wonder how their health was going, how they are holding up, how they are dealing with this. Has anyone talked about their mental health? So we have started working on those initiatives also that uh, how to bring, bring awareness for, for the faith leaders to be careful and cognizant of their own health care because we do know there is compassionate fatigue happening there is high burnt out rates we haven't seen um, maybe one or two reported cases of completed suicides uh, but we haven't seen that much and I don't know if it is underreported or there's the stigma that we are not talking about suicide more, but uh, given the research coming out of, from uh, clergies uh, and uh, rabbis, I felt 
that this is a topic that needs to be um, tackled in the Muslim community as well. So we have started working on uh, improving infrastructure in the Islamic Center, that how can we provide more support and resources to the faith leaders? How can we augment their coping and resiliency skills? How do we give them more time for mindfulness? And how do we provide more congregation support? And I think uh, developing that peer support and community leader um, kind of uh, models have to be augmented. We need more and more people trained as peer supports and uh, more leaders uh, sharing the responsibility with the imam. So I do feel faith leaders and mental health lead, uh, providers, we, we are doing the same work. We, are, we have same goals, um, wellness, well-being. Um, again, the roles have to be, the boundaries have to be established, clearly delineated roles. I might be a practicing Muslim, but I cannot just stand on the pulpit and start giving religious sermons, same way. Uh, imam can be trained in first aid mental health, but just does not become a mental health provider. He can identify and uh, refer and use the system well. Um, seem to have lost Dr. Abbasi. Hope she'll be able to join us again. Apologize for that. Let me just check. Yes, I believe her. So um, apologize for that. Hopefully she'll be able to join us back for Q&A. Uh, let me see if Evan is available. Evan, can you come on? Excellent. Well, thanks so much, um, Dr. Abbasi. The work that she is doing is so incredible to um, address how the Muslim community is being empowered to address mental illness. So we so appreciate her coming on and sharing what she is doing. Um, and now we have a chance to hear from Evan Owens and to hear how Reboot Recovery is empowering people around the country to address trauma and crisis, building on the work serving and supporting veterans in our military community. So Evan, excited for you to hear from you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Can everybody hear me okay? Everything good coming through loud and clear? You sound great, Matt. Take right. it away. Good deal. Well, I will uh, screen share in a minute. But first off, just thank you to everyone for sticking with me. I'll try to be somewhat entertaining in some way, I guess, after the other two presenters shared. Uh, as I put in the comments here, if you have any questions or follow-ups or want more information on anything I share, you can just email me at evan at rebootrecovery.com. I'll get that over. And then also, I don't know if I can, I'll try to maybe answer some of the Q&As as I go as well. And Ben, I saw that Farah just joined back in. Did you want to let her finish? Did you want to kick it back to her? Oh, I just, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm uh, working through the hospital and uh, the internet just <laughs> disconnected. So I'm back, but I, I'm just uh, going to end with the comments and uh, let you continue. That yes, uh, we have to each be cognizant of each other's roles and be respectful but we have to absolutely work together, especially given the scarce mental health resources and the crisis, impending crisis that we are anticipating post COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. That was great. I, I wish she could go ahead and finish my presentation for me. I'll just let you keep going uh, there, but uh, well, awesome. Well, as Ben said, I'm Evan with Reboot Recovery. And uh, I'll be sharing my screen in a minute. Before I do that, I just wanted to give you a, a kind of an interesting little story of how I got here. Uh, I think I am one of the peers. I am one of the everyday people. I had a background uh, actually in the music industry and also working in technology. And my wife, she worked with traumatic brain injury at Fort Campbell, uh, which is a large military base working with the soldiers there. And every day she'd come home talking about these complex and compound issues that many veterans were struggling with. And I just felt this move in my spirit that said, Evan, you should do something about this. You should do more than play in a golf tournament. You should do run, more than run in a 5K. You should do more than just donate money to somebody else having the, the impact. You should actually be part of the solution. And so that started me on what's now become about a 12 year quest to learn everything that I possibly could to absorb as much information as I possibly could so that I myself could become a peer 
a coach, a peer leader in this space. And uh, it's, it's been amazing. So I'll, I'll screen share with that real quick and I'll share kind of how we got there. Um, and we'll kick over to this. All right, everybody should be able to see my screen. Well, this is Reboot Recovery. Uh, shortly after I began doing this, my wife and I began inviting veterans into our home and we wanted to have conversations where faith and trauma, faith and mental health collided. And we started off with just a few families. Pretty soon Fort Campbell called and said, hey, we'd like you to, to host your group on a military base. That was amazing. But we struck this nerve, as the other two speakers have alluded to, that there were so many people who had that same heartbeat that I did. They wanted to do something about it, but they needed an easy way to do it. And these weren't even pastors. These weren't clergy. These were just people, everyday people who had loved ones. They were friends, families, neighbors, coworkers of people who were dealing with all types of, 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 of mental health and trauma issues. At this point, it was all military. Well, what began in a li living room didn't stay in a living room. We ended up putting together a 12-week combat trauma healing course and training leaders around the country. We started off with one group. Within about two and a half years, we had grown from one location to, to about 200 military uh, course locations around the world uh, on seven countries. And we've continued to do that. And, and uh, about a year and a half ago, we launched a first responder program. Little did we know that that program would be so needed today. Uh, as it has been. And so this is the mission statement. Reboot Recovery helps people overcome trauma and mental health challenges. We do this through our outcomes-based trauma healing courses and online community called My Reboot. This is a little bit about our organizations. You'll see here, this is our first responder program. It can be led by anybody, churches, apartment buildings, office parks, basements, you know, living rooms, all make great locations to host one of our courses. If you are interested in that, I can share with you, but it's, it's a program that's gonna teach you how to facilitate one of our trauma healing courses. Again, they're 12 weeks long. The course is for the entire family and you follow a detailed curriculum throughout. The same is true with our military program, Reboot Combat Recovery, which is a the, the pioneer, that's the first one that we've built. Uh, for the first responder group, you can see here we've had, uh, I think we have about 70 or 80 locations already. We launched about a year and a half ago, the combat one I already talked about. And this other one's a new one that we're in the process of, of developing and rolling out, which will be more for the general public. And so this will be a 12 week course to help heal from trauma. So, you know, a lot of our churches are interested in hosting this, a lot of uh, things like that. And then these other two programs down here, I wanted to highlight quickly because they may be of interest to you. The first is called Overcome Academy. And I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time talking about it today because it is actually our, uh, our training that's specifically designed for small group, uh, prayer team, uh, leaders, things of that nature. So if you're a small group leader, if you're a prayer team leader, if you're a, a uh, you know, sort of supporting cast in one of these types of, of faith-based organizations, this is an ideal training for you. And I'll walk through that. And then lastly, My Reboot is our online center. It's really our place where we say people can heal from anywhere, one click at a time. It's our library of content. So all, we have tons of other courses. We've got a five-part COVID course. We've got a course for sexual trauma. We've got a course for all sorts of things are all housed through this My Reboot platform. And you can get to that by going to my.rebootrecovery.com. But like I said, a couple more stats real quick for you. We've had, you know, now over 11,000 people this slides a bit data. We've had over 11,000 people go through our courses and graduate around the country. We had an 81% graduation rate. I mentioned the number. The most important one here is that 42% of graduates become leaders. And this is important because it creates a self-sustaining in terms of a, a growth movement. And uh, each week, nearly 12, uh, it should say 1,200. I don't know why it's a 12K. That's a typo. I mean, 1,200, 12,000 would be great too. I'd be happy with that. But it should be 1,200 leaders facilitate our courses around the country. And this is a great, easy on-ramp to care for a lot of people who wouldn't otherwise come to something. Uh, they'll come to one of these courses because they're peer-led, they're community-based, they're for the entire family, including the support structure, whether that be a spouse, caregiver, partner, et cetera. So quickly, the Overcome Academy, I won't spend too much time going through that, but this, um, this Overcome Academy is essentially a four hour training that equips you and your team to know how to respond with confidence to hurting friends and family. This is specifically designed um, as a peer training uh, tool. And this is actually a live workshop that I used to travel around the country facilitating. Um, and I really based it off of being a lay person responding to, you know, honestly hundreds of people per year personally 
um, I got to this place where I realized that there were a lot of mistakes that I had made over the years that I learned um, and that I needed to share with people. And I'll get to some of the questions as well that I see popping up here. And so this course, along with our team, we put together this training. We begin giving it around the country. I'll highlight the four or five things that you're going to learn. You, you know, learn how to respond to confidence, to hurting friends and family, how to help people reframe their trauma and grow through it as opposed to let it destroy them, how to have tough conversations that bring lasting change, how to support people without burning out, and how to manage crisis situations effectively. And so those are... Um, um, some of the the key takeaways, and again, a lot of times we'll have we'll have um, small group leaders, for example, in churches. They are as somebody they are the front line. They are the first responders to a lot of these issues. Not pastors, not not mental health professionals. It's your small group leaders. It's your prayer team people standing at the front after service who come forward. Those are the people who are the, the first responders, and so often they feel underqualified and ill-equipped, and and yet. The reality is, is usually they're the ones who interact with the problem or encounter the problem first. And so that's the way this, this structure kind of works. I also mentioned my reboot, lots of courses. You should go check that out. I see a couple questions here. I want to pause real quick. Someone asked about, um, is it limited to Christians? It's not limited to Christians. It is a Christian faith-based curriculum. And so yes, it, it references um, biblical principles throughout it, but be, because we're active on tons of military bases, we are not, um, you know, proselytizing in any way. We use it as an illustration point. So we talk about it through that lens. And then secondly, is it open to all veterans regardless of discharge? Yes, it is. And then who created the curriculum? So we actually used to say that the curriculum was um, veteran test of veteran approved. But my wife, she's a doctor of occupational therapy. Her specialty is in traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, she and I developed the curriculum over a course of about four years. Since then, we've been fortunate to partner with leaders from the University of Illinois, Belmont University, even some individuals from Duke University to help us do pretty, pretty robust outcomes, assessments, and measurements. We've used tools ranging from the Promise 29, which is a um, mental health uh, uh, mental health scale, a quality of life scale, rather, um, all the way over to um, uh, things like the character strengths rating scale. There's a bunch of different scales we've used, and I can send that if you'd like that entire detail. But basically, it's shown statistically significant improvement pre and post in our leaders. And then I see a question about uh, Spanish. It is not in Spanish yet, although it will be by the end of the year, which is awesome. Um, and no, we do not offer CEUs yet, but we're trying to get approved for that. Um, so that's a little bit about us. I mentioned the 1,200 volunteer leaders. Um, to, to put that in perspective, these volunteers, uh, this is Brian and Jen, for example, they're two of our leaders in the background here. Uh, that's about a four hour commitment a week to lead one of our courses. So it's, it's manageable, but it is a significant thing. So if you multiply that times 1200 people, it's really awesome to see the number of people responding to that, facilitating these, these courses um, around the country. And an average course size is between 10 and 20 people. It's free to participants and the costs are usually covered either by the leaders or by the organization who sponsors those leaders, or us. Sometimes we'll raise money to do that as well. So this is uh, me, this is my email and phone number here. You can get involved at RebootRecovery.com. If you're interested specifically in the Overcome course, you can go to Overcome.RebootRecovery.com. Um, and then I wanted to take a few more questions here. Is this similar to Stephen? No, we actually work side by side with Stephen Ministries. So Overcome Academy is a, uh, we've taken many Stephen Ministers, I guess that'd be with that through Overcome Academy and many of them lead our courses. So it's a compliment to that. Um, is it possible to send out more information? Yes, I, I guess. Um, yeah, and you can also go to overcome.rebootrecovery.com. Uh, and is the course based on evidence-based practices? So um, we are creating an evidence-based practice in the way that we're approaching trauma in the way that we're doing. So we're not using EMDR or CBT or any of the clinical things because our focus is not to create, we're not, we're not training everyday people to become uh, clinically minded. In fact, we're actually saying that, that our best solution is to say we're going to come alongside those people um, and become a support structure. And a lot of our data and research is showing that the number one indicator of long-term health is actually um, authentic, loving, trusting relationships. And so that's our key focus. The other thing that we'll also say a lot of times is, um, you know, our job is not necessarily to focus on symptom reduction. Most, uh, you know, clinical modalities will focus on that. 
our focus is actually on the response to those symptoms. Is it something that helps you experience post-traumatic growth, or is it something that actually leads you to dark, more darkness and more pain? And so that's our biggest focus is focusing on our response to those issues. And I feel like that's where we as people who are faith actually stand the best hope of being able to do it because we, we have a different perspective on pain and, and, and um, on pain and, and trauma and things of that nature than maybe the clinical world does, which is their sole focus is on that. Um, and Ben, I don't know if I can keep taking questions or not. It looks like there's still a few more left, but. Well, Evan, I, will, I just, uh, you're doing such a great job, but could you talk a little bit about how you guys are taking the resources that you've developed and tailoring them to a few different communities? So you guys have the healthcare workers, you have crisis, yeah. that's just the general population. And so you're taking this resource that's been developed previously and you're, you're tailoring it to other communities in the country and you have about one more minute left for that answer. Okay. Yes. We've got all kinds of courses. We've got, um, Ones right now, there's a crisis course for COVID. You can get free on our website at rebootrecovery.com, the main hero image. But we also took our first responder course and we adapted it and we launched it virtually free to medical workers, frontline medical workers. And it's been amazing. We've launched nine or 10 of them now. They're 12 weeks long. Uh, they meet one night per week. And um, every course has been full. The registration, which we cap it out at 24 people, has been full within 48 hours of launching which has really been moving and, and I think it speaks to the peer led movement. Um, yeah. And if people want to learn more about how they could start a, a course or get plugged into any of our courses, this is probably not the best thing, but shoot me an email, Evan at rebootrecovery.com. I'll connect you with myself or our team and we'll get you all the resources you need. You don't have to be a veteran or first responder. You can be just like me, a, a dummy off the street uh, who has a chipped tooth because his son kicked him in the mouth. So you can have that. Too. I've done a good job not smiling while I presented though, Ben, because I look like a, uh, I look like I got in a bar fight. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you were just you were just roughhousing, trying to have some some fun during this moment. Yeah, so, my three year old, yeah. my three year old clocked me. Yep. Yeah, uh, you did a great job, Evan. Well, let me invite Dr. Stanford and Dr. Abbasi back on to the to the video. We have some great questions that have come up, so I want to get to those. Um, first of all, thank you so much to all our presenters. You guys presented such rich and helpful information. We so appreciate your participation and sharing what you did today. Um, make sure uh, there are some questions related to getting additional information we're going to make sure to send email addresses or not sorry contact information as well as websites where you can go and download learn more information about mental health coaching about dr abasi's work and about reboot recovery um, and so make sure to look for that email coming in the next few days uh, that'll also include a link to the recording so that you can go through and think about some more uh, recap anything that you missed um, because we know that some people have trouble with audio at different points, so feel free to check that out um, here in the near future when we're able to get that information out. I want to start with the first question. Uh, many people have noted, and we too have uh, really celebrated the work of Mental Health First Aid. It's a great resource. Dr. Bossi talked about incorporating Mental Health First Aid into her training. But what do you think is, is what you're leveraging? How are you working alongside Mental Health First Aid, but also how are you guys doing something different than just Mental Health First Aid? And I want to kind of come to each of you to see kind of both how are you working alongside and how is what you're doing different from what's been great and what's been widely used in mental health personally around the country. Anyone um, want to go first? Uh, sure. Um, basically, we needed to adapt it to our uh, religious sensitivity and uh, kind of cultural needs. So we adapted that more uh, that, uh, you know, you have to speak the language and make it more uh, acceptable for the community. So already there was a stigma. We had to be really careful because initially when I started working with the faith leaders, there was this fear that I'm trying to uh, kind of change what they are teaching or trying to bring some westernized uh, concept of mental health. But once we started discussing and we realized that the roots of psychiatry actually, uh, if you trace it back, it started in Muslim culture. Avicenna was the first one to create the first mental health asylum, first psych hospital was in Iraq. So when once you start dispelling that kind of fears and mistrust, then it was a natural alliance. And uh, so coming back to first aid, I think it's a really good resource. It's simple, it's basic. And once we adapted and we had more imam, uh, like more 
kind of people who are trained in theology and um, have more religious like background when they started uh, the, become part of this training it just was an easier uh, path from there excellent Pat, you have something to share yeah, a lot of the faith communities that we've worked in um, have done mental health first aid. Um, what we found is that, you know, while it's a, a wonderful general measure to break stigma and help people understand how to support and encourage people, it doesn't really train uh, faith community leadership what to, how to help a person that has a mental health care problem. Like how to, you know, if they're saying, I don't know what to do, where do I go for help? It, it doesn't have that kind of information, uh, you know? And so it's a, it's a wonderful, very general, it's, it's a lot like CPR, like it's supposed to be, you know, kind of helps the person at the moment. Uh, but, uh, you know, what we did is we developed a, something that, that moved, it, moved the person, began to move them down a, a, a recovery path where they're gonna begin, start to get uh, care and treatment that'll hopefully get them to the point where they don't really require that anymore. Um, adding to that, yes, I totally agree. It was a good uh, point to start with, but then we started developing more therapy modules, more uh, interactive dialogue so that the imam gets more coping skills, like understands more therapy and interacting and using resources. Thanks, Dr. Bhatti. Evan, did you have a thought? I mean, they covered it. I mean, they've, yeah, I think we've, we've talked about that. I think the biggest thing is just the reality that, that many people who are in full-time ministry um, definitely are often the referral thing. What I found is, you know, everyday people refer to their local clergy, their local clergy then refers to an expert, you know, and, and I think that actually is a, a challenge. And I think that's where the system is breaking down because what happens is because we feel that uncomfortableness with these difficult conversations, these difficult topics, we end up constantly deferring and referring. And usually we don't even escort a person to care. We simply make a referral and we step away. And that's one of the worst things that we can do, especially if someone's struggling with depression or potential suicidal ideation. And, uh, and I see that with, I speak to pastors around the world and most of them are really proud that they've got this great referral system. And I'm always a little bit hesitant because many times people are coming to the church or a faith organization for answers after they've already been doing or have tried the traditional modalities and they feel still incomplete you know, and they need this faith component so rather than trying to copy what's happening in the mental health world and bring it into the church sometimes i say let's let's let faith components do what faith components do best and let's come alongside and and there's no competition whatsoever i mean it's, it's both and 100 percent dr bossy let me come to you for this next question that i thought was really helpful uh, for those who have joined us and who want to think about how to partner with mental health service providers, we know that you're in a clinical setting, even uh, you know, helping today to join, as you noted. What are some ways in which uh, you would encourage uh, people who care about this issue, faith leaders themselves, to reach out to mental health facilities and, and clinics and build relationships? What are some helpful ways to do that? First of all, Ben, it's a two-way process. I think the providers have to be open and be cognizant that this is and yeah. gonna be a really important, like one thing I've been doing is teaching my medical students and residents that we had just stepped away from taking faith uh, and religious history or background. And I think that's such a missed uh, dimension to, uh, like if we look at the numbers and new, uh, like, you know, peer reports and everything that, 80% uh, Americans identify as uh, belonging to a faith or more people like 80 to 90 are going to organize church or, you know, other faith uh, kind of uh, settings. So the important thing is it is going to be a two-way process, but for the faith leaders, I think it is important. I'll give you a small example from a Muslim uh, community point of view. We just had month of Ramadan, 30 days of fasting. And me, um, like an imam, until unless imam and the provider come together, it's very hard for a patient to understand that if they are not doing well, they are not feeling mentally uh, well, then they are exempted from fasting. As much as they are exempted from fasting for physical health reasons, they are exempted for mental health reasons. So for them, uh, any faith leader, uh, I think uh, there are, I think we are working on creating a directory uh, 
of uh, providers, mental health providers who identify as faith-based uh, kind of mental health providers. And I think that I would really encourage that all of us, we might be belonging to any uh, faith, religion, spirituality, uh, belief system, we should create that uh, directory of providers that are willing to work with faith leaders. And the same way the faith leaders uh, I would start with uh, just reaching out to any of your local psychiatrists that you work with in the community. Excellent, Dr. Bhatia, yeah. thank you so much. Go ahead, Evan. No, I would just say exactly right. In my experience, they've been fairly welcoming. Um, the biggest fear, I think, has been the proselytization fear. You know, are we going to try and persuade everyone over and you know, the other thing is they'll always say, well, you know, how much training do you have in mental health? And I always laugh and I say, how much training do you have in spiritual health? And they say hardly any. And I'll say, well, great. Then we're, we're coming from the same perspective then in terms of well-roundedness. And I say that jokingly, of course, uh, right. in, in, in jet. But um, I find that I, if I go in and I, I have my guard down and I just say, look, I'm looking to send people to you because I don't want to do what you do. You are the expert in your space. But I think we can work together to provide a better outcome. Um, usually it's a pretty well received, usually. Um, and, and especially working in first responders and military bases, you can see that that would be, a, it's a very complicated conversation. This is not just your average community driven psychology center, or I don't know what a psychology center is, you know, mental health clinic. Um, this is a, a complex web of, of approval. So, yeah. And we're a little over time, but I, I really appreciated this one question that we received, and it would be great to hear from you each. Um, as we create these new roles, as we train more individuals, how are your organizations and the work you're doing supporting those individuals? Um, is there ongoing training and, and encouragement? Or they, if they have an issue that comes up, can they reach back up to people? Matt, for mental health coaches, are there somebody who's coaching the coaches as far as like being there to support them if a more uh, challenging issue comes up that they're not sure how to address? Um, so can each of you describe the ways in which with these new roles you're providing, you know, not not clinical supervision, but something similar to that where, where if issues come up, they have someone that they can reach out to to address some of the more pressing issues that might come up. And let's just go down the order that we did the presentations. And Matt, can you go first? Yeah, with our mental health coach program, we uh, are collaborating with the American Association of Christian Counselors now and offering the 40-hour training online. So uh, it can be accessed now online. Uh, and actually, at the moment, it's free. You can do it for free. Uh, you're certified by the American Association of Christian Counselors uh, as a mental health coach. And then you will, uh, be have, you will have the ability to have access to um, uh, our clinicians and support staff that can answer your questions, help you get connected into your faith community and, and things like that. So we are offering a backup, you know, as far as, um, as that goes. Yes, and someone just asked, the training for the male health coach is not in Spanish, but all of the resources are available in Spanish, yes. Thanks, Matt. Dr. Bassi, how are you supporting the people who you are training to, to so, connect to these um, and we have the annual Muslim Mental Health Conference that we kind of becomes a really good uh, kind of a retreat for all of us. We connect, we support. But besides that, there are a lot of initiatives, initiatives that are happening. Khalil Center uh, is providing a lot of counseling. Then uh, there is Family Youth Institute. There is uh, American Muslim uh, health professionals that are bringing us all together. There is mental health directory happening. There's in, so there's so many now uh, work happening, Institute of Muslim Mental Health, uh, crisis hotlines. But I think uh, behind the scene, we are really coming together. We have a lot of WhatsApp groups. We have directory. We are constantly, it's almost like uh, we, we, we are identified as like, okay, these people are putting themselves in front of the movement that they be kind of constantly support and uh, advise each other and continue to come up with new ideas and initiatives. Excellent, and Evan? Yeah, great question. We, um, we have a couple different things we do. One is we've got a, a tiered coaching system. So we've got people on staff who are considered head coaches is what we call them. Um, and then um, we also have people who are seasoned leaders who have led courses for a long time, who mentor other more new leaders. Um, and then we also have, this is 
sounds silly, but it's incredible. We have a private Facebook group for all of our leaders around the country. And it's really a community hub where people come together and communicate and the stories that I, I mean, it keeps me deeply connected to these leaders. I know what's going on in almost every group in the country because they share almost after every single meeting, you know, different groups meet at different times during the weekend. They'll post, here's what happened. Here's what I learned. Anybody experienced this before? And it's just that kind of um, community support, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, and many of our leaders are people who have struggled with mental health or trauma themselves. Um, and so they're not only just working through their own, they're continuing to uncover layers of their own hurt and pain as well. So that's how we do that. Excellent. Well, thank you uh, to each of our presenters, but I also want to thank our audience, more than 1,000 people who came together from around the country to think about, to consider some of the ways that people are being trained as we're seeing increasing mental health challenges and having more and more people come. These training programs are some that can uh, help create more people, uh, empower more people to address the challenges that we're going to see not only today and not only tomorrow, but in the coming days and months. And so we're excited to share. You will be able to have links uh, to a lot of these resources and the trainings that are available, the resources that are out there in the follow-up email. So thank you to each of you for the work you're doing, uh, not just on this webinar, but day in, day out, providing these trainings across the people in the country, creating more people who can serve the individuals in need. Uh, please share this information. If you want to share the recording when it comes out, if you want to share links uh, to what has been presented, you can share that with other people who you know who might be interested. So feel free to do that. Uh, we always appreciate pe more people hearing about the great work that's being done. Uh, we hope you can join us for our next webinar. We've already talked about it a little bit today, but we want to encourage mental health professionals themselves to incorporate spirituality into the services they're providing. And so we're going to talk about how mental health professionals can do some of what we talked about today, um, incorporate spirituality, the spirituality assessment that Dr. Abbasi talked about. There are various ways in which clinicians can incorporate spirituality and faith into the services they're providing. And so we want to talk about that in the last of our webinar series, and then we're going to be launching a new webinar series in the next month that will talk about more ways that faith and community groups can address mental illness in the country for individuals across the country. Please let us know if you're interested in learning more, connecting with us on a, on a more regular basis. You can email us at partnerships at hhs.gov or go to hhs.gov slash partnerships to sign up for our newsletter. And that's all. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you to our presenters once again. We hope you and your loved ones stay safe and healthy during this challenging time. Many thanks to you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.